Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Christopher Stevens. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the ABCs of ulcerative colitis today. Um, essentially, this is another inflammatory bowel disease talk, fairly similar to what you've heard. And we'll probably hear a few overlaps between what Dr. Keeley just presented on Crohn's disease. Because a lot of times, these are sort of overlap conditions. Uh, but I'll try to focus on maybe some of the differences uh, to give a sense of, of really uh, uh, what is involved with ulcerative colitis. Uh, so this is me. I'm with the University of Minnesota. My primary practice location is out in Maple Grove. Uh, and I've been in practice about five years. And about 30% of my practice is IBD. And I also do general GI. I don't have any disclosures. Um, so today, we want to recognize that ulcerative colitis is, is fairly common. We'll go through what are the common symptoms and present a few cases. Discuss why we want to treat ulcerative colitis to prevent chronic complications. Um, think about what those medical treatments are and briefly look at when surgery may be needed. Um, just a couple cases to start with. So this is going to sort of outline what is the varied spectrum uh, that ulcerative colitis can present with? So we have a, a one person here, Ronald, who's 44, and he comes in with sort of this intermittent rectal bleeding and some urgency with bowel movement uh, really over the past several years. Um, hasn't brought him in until now. When we look at him, you know, he appears pretty well. He gets some labs and, and things like that we want to check our inflammatory markers like CRP levels. We want to check blood counts. We check some stool studies to make sure there's no infection, things like that. It all looks fairly normal. We do a colonoscopy and we see some mild inflammation in the rectum. I don't know how well this is presenting up there, but what we see is that, that on a colonoscopy, we kind of grade inflammation, okay, by this Mayo score. And that would present the, the spectrum from normal, where we can kind of see this normal, nice vascular pattern. It looks very smooth. When we look at Mayo 1, we start to see it's maybe a little bit red. Uh, uh, we sort of lose that vascular pattern. Mayo 2, uh, you start to get some friability and some, some very small erosion start to present. And with Mayo 3, you start to get bleeding that we see. You see a lot of ulcerations and things like that. And so that's a very important way that we can stratify endoscopically how severe the colitis is. So for him, we put him in more of like a male one category. We contrast that to Jennifer. She's 22. And she comes in with a more acute presentation fairly recently of bloody diarrhea. It's going on many, many times a day. And she also has some other symptoms. Um, she's got some joint pains and some back pain, and and she she appears unwell. She appears sick. She, her abdomen is tender when you push on it. Her labs show kind of low blood counts. It shows elevated inflammatory markers, and her liver tests are also elevated. So clearly, a much more significant presentation of colitis. And for her, when we look at what is her Mayo score, when we take a look at the colitis we see that it's more in this Mayo 3 type of activity. Okay. So we'll kind of come back to these in a little bit. Now, you sort of saw uh, with Dr. Keeley's presentation that, that with IBD in general, multiple factors are involved uh, for the proportion of people that get IBD. We know that there's some genetic susceptibility. We know that there is a role of, of probably the microbiome and, and some environmental triggers. Uh, and an in, in abnormal immune response. But only when all of these intersect in the middle is the proportion of folks that get inflammatory bowel disease. So a lot of these things are still being worked out. You know, just a couple of examples of, of some of the things that we do see is higher rates in northern latitudes. We do see it more commonly in younger individuals that present, you know, 15 to 30 is the most common, but it can be at any age higher rates in Caucasian people, higher rates in people with a family history of IBD, and maybe some of these um, environmental or dietary things that go and contribute to the development of IBD. But we can see that it's very complex, it's multifactorial, and there's a lot that still needs to be worked out. You already saw this slide on Dr. Keeley's talk as well. And this, this uh, again, just sort of illustrates that, that this is a, a condition 
that is sort of really in the modern era. Uh, we didn't really see it until the 1850s when we saw the rise of rates of inflammatory bowel disease in the Western world. In more newly developed countries, you see the rise from the 1950s onward, and we're seeing higher and higher rates as we go. So there really is something in our environment, what we're eating, what we're doing, that does contribute to ulcerative colitis. Now, this sort of reflects those cases that we saw in that there's sort of a variability with, with the presentation of ulcerative colitis or how it affects people. Down here in this picture, we can see that about 30 to 60 percent of patients only present with inflammation just in the rectum, and we call this proctitis. The symptoms of proctitis may be bleeding, it may be urgency, it may be feeling like you need to have a bowel movement all the time, um, but it doesn't tend to have the more sort of uh, whole body aspects that, that left-sided colitis or extensive colitis do. Left-sided colitis, people tend to get more abdominal pain along with it, they tend to have more diarrhea. And it's folks with extensive colitis throughout the entire colon that end up having um, more of those what we call constitutional type symptoms. So the weight loss, uh, you know, more significant abdominal pain, fatigue, maybe they get fever and, and they tend to have a more severe disease. Um, who does this uh, affect? Well, you know, as I mentioned, there's increasing rates um, out of the Mayo Clinic. Uh, they reported uh, a few years back that it was about 286 per 100,000. The rates are, are likely, this is probably an underestimate of what we're seeing today, but that would indicate we have about at least 16,000 people in Minnesota and, and well over a million in the United States with ulcerative colitis alone. Uh, IBD, including ulcerative colitis, can go and affect uh, much more uh, than just the colon, okay? These are basically where, where else we see um, effects of inflammatory bowel disease. The ones in the light green are kind of the more common things that we see with ulcerative colitis. We have eye issues, liver issues tend to be um, uh, very common uh, in ulcerative colitis, something called primary sclerosis cholangitis. People are at risk for blood clots, okay? And go joint pains uh, and rheumatologic issues are also quite common. Um, the things in blue are a little bit less common, but suffice it to say that ulcerative colitis um, is a systemic disease, not just a colonic disease. It's also a progressive disease. This is also a similar slide to what you saw in Crohn's disease, and that the longer that you have ulcerative colitis, the more progressive it can be. That if you have ulcerative colitis and it isn't treated, over the long term, you end up having these this mucosal inflammation, okay? And that can go and progress as you get scar tissue, you can end up getting stricturing, you can end up developing precancerous changes in the colon and eventually need a colectomy. And so again, this presents an opportunity that if we're able to intervene earlier in the course of disease, we can kind of change that line instead of having more and more severe changes in the colon, we can actually follow this line and sort of uh, uh, clear out those inflammatory changes and not uh, uh, have uh, that progression to needing a colectomy or risking development of colorectal cancer to the same degree. Now, how do we do that? Um, well, we want to have targets to treat. We want to think actively about how are we going to treat this colitis, okay? Um, this is the, the treat to target type of strategy. Um, over here, we can see if we have a person with active IBD, we want to identify targets that we want to try to reach with our treatment, okay? So some targets may be shorter-term things. We want people to feel better, okay? We want people to go and, and have normalization of their labs. Maybe that's their inflammatory markers. Maybe that's their blood count. Maybe that's their stool inflammatory markers. And ultimately, our, our real goal or the end point is that if we can heal up the colon and end up going from, say that, you know, Mayo 1, Mayo 2, Mayo 3, back to a normal looking colon, or take biopsies and have normal looking biopsies, that is one of the best goals that we can have to avoid the long-term complications. If at any point we're going and we're giving therapies, we're constantly reassessing. We want to pick, well, you know, maybe we need to reassess it every three months, every six months, every year. Where are we with this? If we're not reaching our target, then we need to really rethink what are we doing with our therapy and maybe we need to make some changes. 
And we really want to individualize how we're treating colitis. As I mentioned before, on, on that other slide showing the different places where colitis can be in the colon, a lot of people maybe have more limited or more mild disease, okay? There are really the minority of people that have more moderate to severe disease and may need advanced therapies like the biologic or small molecule therapies that we'll talk about. This is the pyramid that was briefly touched on and, and that the, the way colitis used to be treated was you sort of start at the bottom and, well, if you fail mesalamine or sulfasalazine, you move on to steroids or immunomodulators on up. Really how we treat it today is we want to identify people that are at risk of having severe disease or progression, okay, those moderate to severe patients, and start more up here with those biologics or those small molecules, okay, uh, and do that up front, okay. If people uh, have very mild disease, very limited disease, then, then it's certainly fine to start with maybe these more like oral or rectal locally acting therapies that may have less risk of side effects, okay. So if we start with people uh, with more mild uh, colitis, we think about using things like sulfasalazine or mesalamine type products, and how I think of these are locally acting anti-inflammatory agents, okay? A lot of the names you hear like Azacol, Lialda, Prezel, Colazole, all of these things are basically the delivery mechanism to try to get this mesalamine product down to the colon where it gets released and shuts down the inflammation. The Panasa and Rowasa, these canasa are rectal suppositories, rolosas, and enema. Those are very good if you have very limited, say, proctitis or, 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 or inflammation that's only in the rectum uh, or in that first part of the colon. These deliver a high amount of medication directly to where it needs to be, and it doesn't rely on these other delivery mechanisms, and so that can be very effective there. Steroids, we also briefly touched on before. Um, and, and really, we want to think of these as sort of the, the rescue therapy or to get people feeling better sick. And they do make people feel better, okay? They shut down inflammation sick. They provide some, some quick immunosuppression. Uh, you get some secondary pain relief. But if you see down here, they have a lot of off-target side effects. There's a lot of side effects that can go uh, wrong. This is primarily long-term use. So we don't worry too much with short-term use. It's really uh, once we're staying on them that we run into all of these sorts of issues, which is why we need to think about other advanced therapies like the immunomodulators, biologics, and small molecules. Okay? The one thing that I'll say, though, is that budesonide, you oftentimes hear that. It's sort of thought of as a little bit less risky option for steroid use. And the reason why is that whether you give it rectally or whether you have the oral budesonide that you take, it gets released in the colon, is essentially kind of filtered out by the liver before it gets out to the rest of your body. So it is a steroid where you can sort of avoid some of those other uh, uh, side effects to the rest of the body. Immunomodulators, um, these are things like azathioprine or mercaptopurine. A lot of times today we're using these in combination with what's called the anti-TNF biologic medications. Those are things like infliximab, adalimumab. Uh, and these immunomodulators, they, they're fairly broad immunosuppression. They actually work quite well, um, uh, but we, they do take a long time to achieve effect. You got to monitor them, them frequently. And the reason why is there is a little bit higher side effect profile, including risk of, of say, lymphoma or non-melanoma skin cancer. And so a lot of times we think that biologic therapy over the long term probably has a little bit better side effect or risk profile. Now, when we talk about biologics and small molecules, what are they? Okay, the biologics are over here. We have the anti-TNF uh, uh, medications, that's infliximab, adalimumab, golimumab, uh, the, the vetalizumab, and ustekinumab. Okay, so biologics are large molecules. Okay, they're, they're, they're made in, in sort of living organisms, and they're very large molecules that are very specific for whatever pathway they're trying to shut down. Okay. Um, Small molecules are very small, okay? It doesn't, so that's why you can take those orally, okay? The, bi the biologics, you have to have IV or subcutaneous. The small molecules are oral, okay? And so that's why they can be absorbed. They can get through your whole body. It doesn't mean that one is any more safe than the other, okay? It's just sort of a different delivery mechanism based on their size and how they act, okay? Those are things like the tofacidinib, the and the
I'm going to go fairly quickly through the rest of these. You've seen some of these, the anti-TNFs. Primarily, we're using things like infliximab or adalimumab. This is a slide from immunology. I get about a tanercept. That's not for IDD. Um, Golumumab would be the other choice in this class. Again, great first-line option, long track record of safety and efficacy, um, small risk of cancers, lymphomas, and a lot of the other things that you've already heard about. Um, but these, uh, the, the benefit, by and large, for patients in that moderate severity category outweighs those risks. Okay? Vetalizumab, uh, what it does is it prevents immune cells from getting to the lining of the colon. Uh, has a great, um, uh, has a very good uh, 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 safety profile, has a very good efficacy profile, and is another very good first-line option uh, for the treatment of ulcerative colitis in that biologic class. And this is oftentimes something that we go to first um, in today's treatment, okay? Um, Stelara, or ustekinumab, is sort of the last one in the biologic category, that's the IL-1223 medication, also used in Crohn's disease, okay? Um, again, excellent safety, um, very small risk of infection, it's convenient. Um, you don't get antibodies. And when I say antibodies, basically with any of these biologic medications, you can your body can end up sort of recognizing these drugs and actually create antibodies, which breaks them down and makes it so that your risk of an allergic reaction is higher. Uh, or uh, the drug doesn't work anymore. And so things like ustekinumab uh, or vetalizumab don't have as high of a risk as those other ones. Um, the small molecules, which we'll talk about next, those are things like um, ozanamod here, uh, the, the JAK inhibitors. Um, those actually don't have any risk of having this is one of our newest ones, Rosanamod. Um, kind of like vetalizumab, it prevents the um, it prevents your body's immune cells from tracking to the colon and sort of traps them in the lymph nodes. Okay, we don't have as much experience with this drug because it's fairly new, uh, but it seems to have a fairly good safety profile, and we'll probably be seeing more of this down the road. Tofacitinib and upadacitinib are the JAK inhibitors. Tofacitinib has been out a few years. What is great about these are very rapid onset of action, okay? Um, there have been some risks that have been sort of associated primarily with tofacitinib in people with rheumatoid arthritis as far as heart concerns, DVTs, things like that. We haven't seen that as much in patients with ulcerative colitis. Upadacitinib is one of the, uh, the newest ones that's out. It's a more selective JAK inhibitor, and so we hope it's going to have an a even better safety profile. And the uh, efficacy rates and are, are really good, and it tends to work very fast. Briefly, why is surgery needed? Um, there are certain people that are hospitalized. Maybe uh, they have something uh, called toxic megacolon. They're at risk of perforation, uncontrolled bleeding, or refractory colitis, and also a higher risk of cancer. That's why surgery may be needed. We see that in about 3 to 5% of hospitalized folks. Um, uh, up to 18% of people uh, with long-standing ulcerative colitis will get colorectal cancer and end up needing colectomy. The overall risk is 20 to 30% over their life. And then the, basically the entire colon needs to get removed. Um, it doesn't mean some people will wind up with an, an endostomy, um, but there are surgical techniques to essentially use a small bowel to create a pouch or, or almost like a new rectum to have things put up, hooked up in a more you know normal fashion as well. Um, that's all I'll say about surgery, um, as I'm not a surgeon, but that's sort of the basic outline. Probiotics and things, some, some evidence for VSL number three, ongoing research into the microbiome, complementary and alternative medicine, as we touched on. Uh, small studies, there's not a lot of data. Um, overall, fairly safe, though. So what about our patients? Um, you know, back to Ronald, remember, he had that limited proctitis, okay? He really is treated well with just the mesalamine suppository at night. Um, his follow-up and treatment plan is going to be fairly limited. He goes into the office once a year, maybe gets some labs, has his regular colon cancer screening every 10 years. That's in contrast to Jennifer. She had acute severe ulcerative colitis. She also had some liver involvement, like we talked about. She was hospitalized, and now she has a very intensive treatment plan where she needs to come in for frequent office visits, 
you know, she's on, you know, infliximab and azathioprine, so we have to make sure that she's seeing, you know, dermatology and OBGYN. She's having her joint issues looked at by rheumatology. She's seeing hepatology and needs frequent colonoscopy. It's a very different situation. So, as I said, there's sort of there's a big range. So, finally, uh, ulcerative colitis is common. Uh, it needs a whole treatment team. Really, what you're doing here today um, and gaining more education is one of the most important things to kind of help you to, to really develop a good treatment plan in conjunction with your doctors and, and, and have, you know, a, a good, good outcomes and a good quality of life overall. Um, I can take a few questions. Yeah, so that's a good question. The, the question is, it, it, when is there injectable, is injectable and TVO approved in the U.S., or when is that coming? So, uh, so injectable and TVO uh, works. There's been some trials that have looked at that, and it seems that it is efficacious. Um, I don't know of anyone that knows when it is coming in the United States. Um, I don't think it's going to be within the next, you know, year. Um, it's still some time off, to my knowledge. We had a very similar question in one of the physician sessions earlier today, and, and the jury's still kind of out on that. There may be other ones, too. Not only not only vetalizumab, but actually uh, uh, infliximab, or I think inflector was looked at over in the European population as an injectable every two weeks as well. And so that may also be something that's efficacious, but again, not approved in the United States. Yeah, um, so, so the question is, how do you tell the difference between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's? And, and it can be challenging sometimes because it is, it is a spectrum, okay? A lot of it, it does have to do with, with um, what is the extent of inflammation? Do we see sort of this continual inflammation from the rectum up through the whole colon? Does it involve the small intestine? Crohn's tends to involve the small intestine uh, and, and maybe even the upper GI tract where ulcerative colitis tends to be just in the colon. There can be patterns when, when the pathologist reviews those biopsies to look at it. And so a lot of times we can go and review, you know, that data and, you know, what, what are the patients sort of presenting, you know, symptoms? Is it only the colon or the small intestine? Does it involve anything else? What does it look like under the biopsies? And we can put it in the bucket of Crohn's disease, put it in the, bu the bucket of ulcerative colitis. Some people have what we call indeterminate colitis. And essentially that's a way of saying it's not Crohn's, it's not ulcerative colitis. We don't exactly know. Uh, a lot of the, the similarities you saw between this talk and the Crohn's disease talk is that it doesn't always matter 100% because a lot of the treatments are the same. Um, which means that we have effective therapies kind of regardless. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, the the longer term, you know, effects of COVID in, in people with inflammatory bowel disease is still being looked at. We're still learning a lot because this is something, you know, we didn't know about prior to three years ago. We didn't know about this. And so we're still learning what happens over the long term. How do we treat it? What's the role of, you know, long COVID and inflammatory bowel disease? You know, I think the biggest thing is to kind of go back to the basics when we think of treat to target, you know, in you know, if things are not working how they used to be, you have to go and sort of reevaluate where are you in, in your stage uh, of, of, say, disease activity, what are our targets we're trying to achieve, and think about do we need to make changes in medical therapy uh, in order to sort of reestablish, you know, control or remission. So it can be pretty challenging, and I think a lot of those details of how COVID and inflammatory bowel disease works out are still 